Mr. Kessler is with the uh, Division of Wage and Hour, excuse me, Wage and Hour Division, I believe. And they have very long titles that I can't ever seem to memorize. <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to say thank you and welcome. Uh, they've graciously agreed to visit with us uh, regarding the recent rule changes that apply to the employers of H-2A sheep and livestock herders. Uh, we do have a lot of questions and topics to cover in a short amount of time, so we're going to try and do a little moderating and make sure we keep moving forward and, and cover a, a lot of topics quickly. Um, We've identified some basic areas of discussion that they're going to address, and hopefully those lead into some questions and, and uh, some clarification for everybody. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time and efforts in the rule. Uh, real quick, I would like to say thank you. Uh, there's currently a proposed change in the process for applications that Mr. Pasternak's working on, and that's going to help us out quite a bit uh, with timing and economics. So. Uh, once again, I appreciate your help on that. And with that being said, how about a, an overview of the changes and some of the intent uh, in your changes? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Kelly said, I'm Brian Pasternak. I'm the National Director of Operations. I manage the temporary visa programs in the U.S. Department of Labor. So we handle the H-2A program, but also 2B and H-1B skilled workers. Um, most of my staff are remotely located out of Chicago. Uh, we have the National Processing Center there. Um, I wanted to thank uh, ASI and Kelly for sort of um, inviting us to attend, um, our department for allowing us to be here. The rule is certainly um, of, of interest to um, our department, our administration, but also to the ranching community. Um, we uh, received, particularly from ASI and, and its members, some very substantive, thoughtful um, comments about the proposed rule, which um, we did publish in April of last year. Um, but the comments not only expressed sort of concerns and some support for things that we were proposing, but also offered some practical ideas and solutions. And the rule itself, I think, uh, reflects a, a lot of compromise, a lot of um, input that came from both industry, but we also had uh, extensive comments come in from worker advocates as well. For many of you uh, may not be familiar with the regulation itself sort of stemmed from a successful legal challenge that was filed against the department some years ago that challenged the secretary's authority to handle sheep herding, goat herding applications, uh, range production of livestock using what's called administrative guidance letters or our administrative discretion. Uh, we did not have and have, haven't had for decades uh, a regulatory framework for processing these applications. Um, that. Um, that legal challenge succeeded, and the court ordered the department to expeditiously try to regulate these jobs, which we have always sort of seen as very unique and did not sort of fit within the normal H-2A program framework. So that's what we embarked on. Um, it was a very aggressive time frame, and I don't think we've really done a rule that, that quickly. Just by comparison, um, the, the rule itself from front to back is about 114 pages. The sheep herding uh, range production of livestock jobs in the H-2A program is roughly about one, maybe at most, 2% of the total volume in the H-2A program. And the other 99% of the program, the regulations that govern them is 113 pages. So the H-2A herder rule is as large as the overall program itself. And I think that pretty much speaks to the importance of the jobs to the industry and in the ranching community, and also it was reflective of the kind of comments that we got, and we got a lot, um, 508 comments to be exact. So we've been implementing the rules since November 16, 2015. Employers are participating in the program. They are participating under the new regs. I think we've gotten about 270 some plus applications representing about 800 jobs already filed under the new rule. That doesn't count all of the cases that we were filed prior to the rule taking effect. So there are people using the program. Um, the rule is not without its transition issues. Um, we have some. We are trying, I think as Kelly briefly referenced, we're trying to come up with some practical common sense solutions that can help ranchers uh, transition into the new regulations. And there are some changes um, that I'll talk about and I'm going to pass it over to Jim too. We'll probably cover four or five areas, if we have time, um, of, of areas of the rule that we think are, are most significant 
in terms of understanding what's happening. Uh, the first area that I'll, I'll cover is sort of eligibility. Um, historically, uh, we operated the program under a guidance letter, and there really wasn't uh, clear definitions for terms in, in, uh, with respect to livestock, um, the range itself. Uh, we even had one guidance letter called the open range production of livestock. Um, and in order for us to demonstrate and justify to the public that these jobs are unique and do not qualify for the normal H-2A program, we had to call out of these jobs their unique features and actually put them into a regulatory framework. So we call that sort of eligibility criteria. So in these jobs, these, these jobs have to involve the herding or production of livestock. Uh, they do have to involve work that's performed on the range for a majority, meaning more than 50% of the work days in the work contract period. The workers have to be on call 24 seven, um, and the nature of the employment has to be temporary or seasonal. So in doing these things and in setting out these eligibility criteria, we had to then define terms. So as we go through the regulation, we had to define what livestock meant. I have been asked for years, uh, I wanna raise horses on the range, does horses qualify? Well, it never really was defined back in the day. So now we have, or defining the job categories or the job activities that involve herding or the production of livestock. Um, so in providing uh, suggestions for some clarity about what governs the activities that qualify for these procedures, we actually are shedding some light on what is permissible. But in doing that, obviously, there are duties, many duties, that are not permissible, that might be performed by workers under the old guidance. So one of the consequences is back in the, back in the old days, we had a standard job description, and everybody was comfortable with a standard job description. Well, when we defined things, ranchers said, we don't want to be pigeonholed. We don't want specific definitions for things because my business operation is different than my neighbors. And that's probably very true. So we erred in defining large categories of duties that can be performed. So there are lots of work tasks underneath them. So in terms of eligibility, we are trying to differentiate these jobs from jobs that would be performed at the ranch or what you would consider to be a general ranch hand. Uh, worker advocates in particular uh, did not see much need for regulating or providing special variances outside of work that's performed on the range because in their minds uh, those workers are general ranch hands and they should be paid by the hour, hours tracked while they're off the range. But we did not actually come down that way. We said that only a majority of their time had to be on the range. But then when they were off the range, they had to perform work that was closely and directly related to the herding or production of livestock. So that we, we preserved some of the work that you need when the workers come back off the range and work near the ranch. But by the same token, those work duties are a little more limiting because the job at the ranch can't be a general ranch hand job in the future. Whereas you may have had a worker help with um, baling hay or repairing a roof or something like that, those kinds of job duties are no longer permissible. So we're dealing in some sense with a change in how the eligibility for the program works. So some ranchers who were in might not, be, might not qualify, but some people who didn't before may. And it really depends on the nature of the business. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there on eligibility because that is one area where we tried to preserve the uniqueness of these jobs. And I'll let Jim talk a little bit more about the job duties because that's where we're starting to see with applications coming in from ranchers, um, how they're describing this work and what's permissible and sort of what constitutes the range. Jim. Hi, good afternoon. So my name's Jim Kessler. And as Kelly said, our titles are too long. So I am the branch chief of immigration and farm labor within the division of enforcement policy and procedure within the wage and hour division. Um, <clears throat> try and fit all that on a card. Um, so as, as Brian talked about this, and, and, you know, and, and I just kind of want to reiterate some of his remarks, that the reason why all this happened was due to litigation. Um, and, and it put us in a, a difficult situation um, and with extremely tight timeframes. 
What we did do, though, is through the process, and we had a good conversation out in the lobby before this, and this was kind of heartening to hear from some people that those 500-some comments that Brian said came in, we did. We sat down and we looked very closely at those, and it was somewhat gratifying to hear that uh, from some of the people who were sitting out in the lobby before this talking to us, that they actually saw in our preamble language to the rule that it reflected those comments, that we had really sit and sat down and taken a close look at, at this. And I think Brian described, I guess, the, the general, the standard H-2A rule uh, against uh, the provisions in, in this special procedure rule. And I guess the one area that I want to kind of uh, point out, so in the Federal Register when this rule printed, it took up four pages. The preamble to the rule took up over 100. And out of those 100 pages, after you get past the economic analysis and, and all that other dry stuff, we spent about 65 pages explaining how we got to where we got. And a lot of this was looking not only at your comments, but the comments from the advocates. And in these days, with transparency within the government, all this is posted up on, on the uh, Federal Register's website. Everybody gets to see everybody else's comments. And you know that really drove our, our decision-making process. And as Brian talked about with this too, when we, when we look to define certain terms, we came to realize too that if we drew certain bright lines, that that would automatically exclude potentially a lot of people from the program. So what we really tried to do with some of the language that we put into the rule was to provide parameters, to provide a degree of flexibility so that people could use the program. The problem is, whenever you introduce flexibility into a rule, you introduce grayness. So I know that's part of what Brian and his team in Chicago are going through now with applications going in. I know with talking to Kelly, you know, one of her concerns has been, you know, you know well, where's Wage and Hour going to come out on this? Well, we've been joined at the hip with Brian and his team in creating the rule. It's not like Brian and his crew were off in a closet somewhere. And you know, my staff and my team read the rule when, when, it, when it published. We worked with them side by side. We have been developing training for the wage hour investigators. Uh, I brought an investigator in from one of our district offices who has uh, been out on sheep herder investigations before so that I had somebody with practical perspective on what actually happens during a sheep investigation to help write the training for the wage hour investigators. And the first thing that we started off with were the slides that Brian used in his webinars when he was first rolling out the rule. So I guess I'm just trying to convey that, you know, we've been working together side by side on this so that we're on the same page going forward. And a lot of the issues that get raised and brought to Brian's attention in connection with what he's seeing on applications coming into Chicago, we talk about. Because for me, that becomes an issue that I want to be able to turn around and communicate to wage hour people in the field so that they're familiar with what Chicago has accepted or, or rejected as they've, they've moved forward. And with part of this too, when I talk about in terms of the litigation and when Brian talks about how we had to come up with certain definitions, well, you know, I can tell you that with the program, you know, what we were hearing from the advocates, and Brian touched on this somewhat, was that these workers should be 100% out on the range. There shouldn't be any, any time for them back on the ranch. That the, if this is really a special program within the H-2A program, that's what they were advocating for. And in other comments, they were advocating for at least 70 or 80 percent. So, you know, we tried to strike compromises with that, too, because we were looking at the comments that all you all sent in and looking at some of your needs. And that's how we came up with eventually settling on a 50 percent criteria, but then still with time back at the ranch that the work that these workers were doing under this program back at the ranch still had to be closely related and directly essential to the, the, uh, the, the lambing and sheep herding operations and the range operations that they were engaged in. Because I can tell you, 
if we didn't put that language in the rule, we would have been sued again. And I don't know what the outcome of future litigation would have been. It may have shut down the program altogether, but you know, those were the choices that we were faced with with trying to write the rule. So <clears throat> what, I, what I would suggest, I know sitting down and reading federal regulations is not your primary goal in life. <laughs> I hope it's not. <clears throat> but <clears throat> for going forward with this and what Brian's seen, please, I mean, not only read the rule, but go back to those pages in, in the preamble and take a look at that where we discussed certain elements as far as you know, why we accepted certain comments or why we rejected certain comments as far as how we developed um, the definition of range. I mean, I think originally we had um, fencing as one of the criteria in there. Um, I can tell you from my own experience last year after we put the rule out and I was driving through Texas <clears throat> and we were passing the ranch for about three hours with fencing along the highway and my wife said, are we still passing the same ranch? And I was like, yes. So for me, that was a takeaway too that, you know, fencing wasn't going to work in this definition, you know, because that was clearly, you know, range land. <clears throat> it was remote. It was isolated. Um, so, you know, so that was a real takeaway. Um, with this too, with the definition of, of range, when we looked at this, it is a four-part test. And we're looking that all four parts are met. We're not saying that three out of four does it, or it's a 50% test. We're not saying that any one of the four factors is controlling, but you do need to meet all four factors for it to be on the range, in our view. Um, and I think I'm going to jump ahead before I turn it back to, to, to Brian on this, but because <clears throat> he, he, he's going to talk about range housing some more. Um, when, when we had looked at the comments, one of the things that came up to us were the idea that uh, there were some stationary structures that people used out on the range in connection with housing. And that, that really vexed us. Uh, we didn't want to exclude those users of the program just because their housing wasn't mobile. We changed up the definition of mobile we, you know, and kind of removed that. Hindsight being what it can be, maybe we could have, should have approached that a little bit differently. But what I will say in connection with that is when we're talking about you know, non-mobile housing um, and whether or not it's usable for the program or not, we are very much looking at whether or not that housing is remote and isolated, not something on the edge of town, not something, you know, um, a stone's throw away from some of the other buildings and things of that nature. We are still looking for that housing to be out on the range and remote and isolated. Does that set you up? Thanks. Okay, so there are fi final two areas and then happy to take questions. The litigation that prompted all this rulemaking also had told us we had to deal with two other issues, and that was wages to workers and housing. And in particular, the litig you, know, you can say what you want about the litigants. They complained about an alleged wage stagnation issues in the program, but also inadequate, insufficient housing. Um, the, the regulation does deal with wages. Um, wages have been, I, we proposed a different wage structure. We got a lot of comments back. I won't go into the details, mostly from ASI, Mountain Plains, Western Range, other major users of the program. That was an example of how industry came forward with not just complaining about what was proposed, but coming up with practical ideas to find a middle ground, which we did in large part accept. Um, housing is a bit of a different issue. Um, the, we received a lot of comments about housing too. Our goal there, in particular in the um, litigation, wasn't maybe necessarily the structures of the housing units. It was more of like dealing with the living conditions of the workers within the units that deals with things like separate sleeping facilities or adequate supplies of water, either for drinking or cooking, bathing, laundry, those sorts of things, meals. We received uh, an amazing amount of ideas and suggestions on how to improve um, housing standards, such as mandating that all employers have a mechanical refrigerator in a unit or 
um, having our office mandate certain percentages of protein or carbohydrates that workers need to have. Um, we rejected um, an awful lot of those suggestions simply because, or the grounds of either cost and the reasons why we reject them are in, the, as Bill, uh, Jim said in the preamble, cost reasons for the businesses, but also just the fact that uh, I don't have experts in Chicago that deal with food nutrition. Um, I, I'm not the person who's going to be running around telling a ranch you got the wrong mix of um, proteins or carbohydrates for your workers, or you have to have some minimum caloric intake um, for your workers. So when you look at the housing standards, the, the structural standards of the units underwent very minimal changes. Where, where we see most of the changes in housing has to do with the, the living conditions that the workers are in, food storage containers so that food doesn't uh, rot, or water supply issues, things of that sort, or heating equipment uh, when, the, when it's going to get into certain weather or, or temperature conditions that uh, can prevent freezing. So those are the areas where we actually did regulate and provide some clarity. One transitional issue that we faced with housing um, when the rule was implemented, because remember my comment about the court imposing a very aggressive time frame for us to promulgate and implement the rule, uh, one of the biggest challenges we faced was we have a lot of housing inventory out there, range housing inventory that employers are using the program. Um, that all can't be inspected at one time when, when the rule is going in effect. And technically, if you file an application under the new rule, your housing technically supposed to meet all of the requirements that are under that rule, including the housing standards. And for us, uh, I work really closely with the states um, in the Mountain Plain, Western states areas. We just don't have the resources to get out and deal with all of that inventory at one time. It's practically impossible. That's one thing. The other is that look at what time of the year it is. Um, weather or climate reasons, states just can't get out to some of the housing. So we had to come up with um, a more practical way of trying to deal with transitioning the housing into the new regs. And so we did put in place some procedures where we would uh, accept prior certifications, even under the old rule, um, that would allow uh, ranchers to move forward in the application process with the condition that the SWA will get out and actually inspect the unit sometime during calendar year 2016. Uh, now, technically, you never find that kind of transition <laughs> policy in the reg. Um, in fact, the reg doesn't really have transition procedures. So this kind of um, call was made more administratively for the sake of what I thought would have been by default shutting the program down because the other consequence would have been I'd have to sit there and hold the rancher's application until spring came and the SWA could actually get out and inspect the unit. So the housing issues in the, in the litigation that was then reflected in the regulation was also one of the areas where we saw some change. But again, as I mentioned, a lot of the structural um, components of housing units really didn't change much. It was more of like the living conditions. So those are kind of the, the major areas of change in the regs. And I'm happy to take questions. Jim and I are happy to take questions for the rest of the time because I think that's what we most wanted is to see if folks could engage us on some questions. Can't guarantee we'll answer everything, but we will certainly try. Yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen, for meeting with us today. I think it's very important. Uh, that's quite a document <laughs> when you go through it. And I think it's going to take patience on both our parts and cooperation to make to make it uh, through it uh, because there are a lot of changes and some big changes in there and I I look at you guys as you know actually as teachers you should be helping us uh, make it through these things and do the things that the regulation uh, calls for but there's an attitude out there that I mean, our people are scared to death of Department of Labor. You mentioned the name, and, and they just start shaking. It should not be that way. Uh, we were audited a few years ago, and I'll be honest with you, it was the worst day of my life going around uh, with the inspectors. And I think that you need, I think that you guys should be helping us, that it should not be uh, punitive right off the bat. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, it seems like to me, my experience anyway, that 
you know, you go after the juggler vein instead of working with people. And I would hope, I would hope that you would train your inspectors that to be more friendly, user friendly, because it, it you know, we're scared of you. I, I mean, there's horror stories of, of some, some of the things that have happened and some of the inspectors you have. And so, you know, it's easier to catch a bear with honey than it is with vinegar. And, and, <laughs> and so I, I, would li I hope and pray that you guys will teach these inspectors, have workshops or something, so that, as, you know, people aren't scared to death of them. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. We should be working together. And there's a lot, there's a lot in that document. And there's a lot of misunderstandings in that. And I hope we continue this process of, of, of meeting and, and working with you. And of course, I know that you've got to help Ke uh, Kelly and Lane a lot to try to get through this thing. But it's going to take, it's going to take some patience and it's going to take over a year. And I think it all boils back to your inspectors. Thank you. So thank you for, for the comment. Um, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll open up the gym to comment about the um, investigation end. But yeah, I mean, we have tried through, and you know, as much as we can reach people through webinars and FAQs that can help clarify what is a fairly sizable document. All right, and it's dense, and it's in a great font three that only my kids can read because I got to put on reading glasses. So it's it's pretty dense, um, and engaging. Kelly's organization or the Western Range to try to help answer some questions. Even my own staff have questions, right? They they have been processing cases for decades under the old guidance letters. They they were comfortable with what they knew, and the rule does usher in some changes as we were just talking about. So there's an education element to this for my own staff and trying to figure out the best ways to try to deal with applications that are coming in because employers are thinking, well, if I put these job duties on this application, is it going to be acceptable? Is it not? I'm worried if, I'm, if I put them on there am I, and I get caught, am I going to get penalized? That sort of thing. So uh, I, totally, I totally hear what you're saying. Do you want to say anything? Well, I appreciate the feedback on the investigators. That's certainly something I can take uh, back with me. Um, and one of the other things that I would, I would say uh, Wage Hour is fully committed to doing other education and outreach. We had this conversation with Kelly out front. Uh, I know, and somehow or another, we seem to have lost them on the way in, but Rich Longo, who is our, oh, there he is. Rich, stand up. <clears throat> Rich is our Director of Enforcement for our Western Region. Rich has been very active uh, in this area, in Nevada, and some other areas uh, doing education and outreach events. So, you know, his name is up on our website. There, feel free to contact Rich. Uh, for our southwest region, and that's kind of a misnomer because it kind of goes from Texas up to Montana. Um, on our website, the director of enforcement for that is uh, Naixa Franquiz. Um, Naixa would be more than happy to have her staff come out and talk to people. It does not have to be a ballroom size like this. You know, we go out and we do education and outreach with much smaller groups too. And we realize this is a new rule we're putting on training for our investigators, and we want to work with you and work with others to get the word out as well. First of all, thank you for coming. Um, after Mr. Kessler's explanation of housing on the range, can you give me a definition of headquarters? That oh, happens the, to also be in the rules? Yeah, there, there is, in the rule there is a, a definition of what sort of buildings constitute the headquarters. So I could probably talk to you right after I get off of the stage and show you in, show you in the document. But yeah, there is, um, I'd probably have to I'd probably have to search for it right now, but um, the, the reg actually defines what's called the headquarters, which is separate and distinct from the range. Uh, ranch headquarters includes ranch house, barns, sheds, pen, bunkhouse, cookhouse, and other buildings in the vicinity. That is considered in the aggregate the headquarters. So when you're away from headquarters, and the workers are working in a, in a geographic location that is away from headquarters. Then the question becomes, is the worker working on the range? And to determine whether they're working on the range, there is a four-factor test 
in the regulations determine whether that is in fact the range. Let me see if I have the back control. Think of it like a donut. <clears throat> headquarters is never going to be the range. Anything outside of headquarters, you got to apply the four factor test. Yeah, so the four factors involves land that's uncultivated, involves wide expanses of land such as thousands of acres, that's actually from the Fair Labor Standards Act, located in remote isolated area. Typically, range housing is required so that the herder can be in constant attendance with the herd. Those are the factors. So when we are looking at what the geographic location where the workers are working away from headquarters, as it's defined, then that determines whether or not the day, the work day they're spending is either on the range or off the range. But let's get back to Mr. Kessler's um, drive in Texas. Vast area, right? Well, there may be a, a, a ranch house and a barn in one part of the area and another one in another part. But is that, is that range housing or is that a headquarters? I think if that housing is located and it's remote and isolated. I think if, thank you. I think if that housing meets the other four criteria that Brian talked about, yeah. and a lot of this is going to be, is it remote and isolated? Yes, it could be. Yeah, in fact, the regulation does bring in those, what they call um, stationary structures, which would be fixed site units that are remotely located on the range. And, you know, I would add to this too, and, and I guess, you know, from this, I guess a workflow type of way. You know, when the applications first come into Brian, I mean, it's gonna be OFLC who's going to look at this. They're gonna be asking you questions about uh, this, that, and the other thing to try and ascertain whether or not it would meet the criteria or not within the regulations. Wage hour is going to be very much guided by what OFLC approves or doesn't approve. But I can, you know, what I do have to add to that is, you know, and we've seen this in the past on in our investigations, is that we see one thing on paper at times, but when we're actually on the ground looking at the situation, it's something totally different. Um, and I can tell you, you know, when we have gone out on investigations before where people have brought workers in under the sheep herder special procedures, I can start with people who didn't even have sheep. That's a problem. Yep. So, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a dilemma for all of us, really, because, you know, in my experience, you all, the people sitting in this room and listening to us talk, are the people who are trying to comply with the law. On the other hand, when we go out, we're faced with not just the people in the room here who are trying to comply, but there are other people out there who are going to bend and twist you know, the rules and regulations or just plain out ignore them in any which way. Um, and I can say from experience too with our investigations, there were times when we ran into workers who, although you know, the applicant had sheep and there may have been two or three or certain workers that went up on the range with the sheep, they had the other half of the workforce staying basically permanently at the ranch doing ranch hand duties, but they had applied for all the workers under the special procedures. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, Brian may say, see certain things on the applications and be able to approve them based on what's on paper in front of his staff. But I can tell you too that when wage hour comes out into the field, a lot of times, you know, what we're actually encountering isn't what we saw on paper. Yeah, there's a lot that my adjudicators in Chicago do give the employer the benefit of the doubt. You, you, you bring an application forward and you say, I raise sheep and this is, this is the application. In Jim's case, I, I will approve it. I don't have people that you know, make a call to a state staff person saying, can you go out and visit that property and make sure that you at least see a couple of sheep out there. I, I don't have people to do that. So we do trust on the application, what is being said and a lot of times. And when we're talking about whether or not the housing is on the range and it's a part of being remote or stationary, my staff can only go so far. Um, they may have some obvious things that may be shown to them that, you know, in fact, when they look at that property on a Google satellite map or something, they may see a subdivision close by and they may ask you a question. Can you please explain how this is remote? And they will go through and ask you about the four factors. Um, and that's, I think, the struggle. We, we, we could have been very prescriptive 
In fact, we started out that way, as Jim said, and excluded a lot of people from the program because we defined the concept of open range. Um, but then we backed off, and instead, we provided a lot of extra flexibility with factors that provide for discretion. So finding the edges of the table get a little bit difficult and a little bit uh, gray when we say, am I on the table or am I off the table? We don't, we may not know. Not at my end, at, at the outset, might know if his investigator goes out and sees something different. So my, my adjudicators are trained to try to give the benefit of the doubt. If there's something there that obviously doesn't look right, they will, they will likely ask a question or ask you to help us understand how your business operates. It's hard to answer the hypothetical up here, but that, that is in essence how it would play out. I'm sorry if I didn't fully answer the question. Sir. Um, thank you again, gentlemen, for coming. Um, I think as there's going to be some other people mention it, probably one of the biggest things has been a lack of communication. And we appreciate your willingness to come out and talk to us because uh, uh, we need to visit with the people who are responsible for writing this and seeing what their interpretation is. Back to some of Steve's comments, we discussed it this morning. Um, a suggestion might be on, on the mobile and fixed site housing, um, maybe not only the remoteness, but it's not really about uh, uh, where they sleep. It's about what they do for duties. So you may have a fixed site housing, as you've mentioned, and, it's, and, and I'm happy to hear your comment about it, that um, uh, it's in a remote location and they're out uh, doing the same thing as the guy staying in, in, in a mobile unit. For instance, you may have a camp here and a house here. If the guard dogs bark, those guys in the camp and in the house are going to respond in the same way. So it isn't necessarily about it, the, where they sleep, it's about their duties. Um, the guy in the camp is gonna get up in the morning, get his dogs, get on his horse, and go out. Same for the guy in the house. It's just a s separate situation, a different type of operation. Um, another comment, I, I, I heard you mention the flexibility um, and how you wrote it into the rule, and it's probably a, a really good thing for both of us. The question I would have is for your investigators, how are they going to interpret this flexibility? That's been a big problem in the past. Uh, uh, in region to region or from uh, outfit to outfit, um, are they going to be able to uh, do a consistent job and take into account this flexibility? So, and we're working on that. I mean, that's why I brought one of the investigators in to, to do training. And we have training set up um, over February and March with several of our offices that are all involved with conducting um, these types of investigations. So for us, that's a starting point as far as consistency is making sure that our staff all get the same training. Yes, sir. The, uh, the gray table, the edge of the gray table. Um, and to piggyback on what's just been said, um, we, we hope you would not only allow but require latitude in the interpretation of these rules and regs, especially at the uh, wage and hour level uh, to make this a workable deal. The industry worked together with you, which was uh, greatly appreciated. We want to see that process continue in the field. And I know I'm repeating some of the, what you just heard, but there is a gray area there that's subject to interpretation. And depending on the intent of the investigators and the whole rule, that interpretation can go one way or the other. Yeah, uh, Kelly and I were, we were all talking to, before we came in here and <clears throat> the gray area will show up with me, you know, on the application side. In other contexts of H2A, there are terms that appear on its face very vague. So for example, sure, herders don't use the normal H2A program, but 
In H2A, if you're a labor contractor, all of your work sites have to be within reasonable commuting distance. Well, who, def who defines reasonableness? So in some sense, we try to apply a framework to what reasonableness is. And in some cases, we may not agree with the employer about what our interpretation of reasonableness is. And sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes, uh, an independent law judge for the department has to provide some clarity for us and on my end for the applications. If my staff think, we, we just don't think that that unit combined with where the workers are gonna be qualify as the range based on the factors and you trying to explain how the business operates, it's possible that we, there may be an independent judge that can help us get a little more clear for some of the definitions that we have that are a bit vague, like the word remote, or, or the word is the property near the headquarters. What's near? Is it 30 miles as a crow flies? Is it hours? What is it? You know, so we've dealt with this in a couple of contexts. We try to be as, as flexible as we can, but we have to have a framework to review some of these terms and wage hours investigators, I'm sure, have the same issue. Um, but I, so I just say, yes, we, we again, sort of pr provide as much um, benefit to the employer and what they're telling us as we can. But if we see something and we ask some questions and we start getting some information that just in our minds just doesn't seem to mesh up, we may take a position on, on that issue. No, it doesn't qualify for the rule. We think it, it should be a normal H-2A application. And remember what I, what I said at the outset, which is we're trying for flexibility to bring as many people into the structure as possible because many of the jobs are unique. But in, in the back of our minds, the advocates are out there saying, there's gotta be a limit to this because we're just, we just have to find the difference between the unique job that's out and it's remote and isolated and it's out there because that's how this, these jobs have been described versus the ones where they're close by the headquarters and they're going out every day and they're coming back and they're staying in the mobile unit but it doesn't move anywhere. Why is that not a normal ranch job? So we're trying, we, we have a balancing act to, to deal with. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to prattle on. But you're so in part, and I appreciate your comment too. Um, with the wage hour investigators, I expect that over the next several years, as they're running into some of this grayness, that they're gonna percolate questions up to us. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that, that we really want them to do. And there are gonna be times where I'm, I'm gonna to turn to Brian and say, you know, what were you guys thinking? And sometimes that may be more along the lines of, what were you guys thinking? Um, I got, I got the, I got but the question, I think that's why did I certify the guy that yeah. didn't, grow, didn't have any sheep? I got the question. <laughs> I can't explain it, yeah. He just didn't have sheep. I thought he did. You, uh, you mentioned that at the Chicago level, you yes. give the grower the benefit of the doubt, the applicant the benefit of the doubt. Oh, uh, that... in, in your interpretation and you, when, when you receive paperwork, you'll... you'll and and I, I guess I, I would finish with this, is that based on the way you worked with the industry, you uh, let us know your intent to make this program go forward and work. And that, the, that needs to be transferred down to the uh, wage and hour level. And that's, that's one of the biggest gripes. It goes back to the first question that was asked of you today. And it goes back to that level. That that intent, which we all have common, we can all agree on that common ground, needs to flow through the entire industry, all the way from uh, down to you and all the way up to the communication at the highest levels. Point well taken. Thank you. There's a comment in the back. Uh, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, I, I feel like uh, we were fairly treated in that uh, representation of rewriting those rules. But we recently had an uh, inspector come out, and she was mentioning something about 500 feet. And when Oh, you... that's from the temporary labor camp standards. It's from the OSHA temporary labor camp standards. I'm sorry, I recognize the 500 feet. But... I, I, I was just curious about it because she said that that might apply to us and when you do the math on 500 feet that's a thousand foot circle on a little building that equates to over 20 acres and um, we don't really have any place where we can put something like that and surround it by 20 acres with no livestock so could you so that is a requirement that's been in the OSHA standards for decades 
for housing safety and health. Um, if you can't meet the requirement, and let me, let me, let me, I'll take a half step back. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about the standard H-2A regulations, not these sheep herder and, and range regulations. So this is- Is that what you're referring to? Or are you, are you talking about the instance where the, the herd is back near the ranch? Um, it was on the headquarters unit that we oh, were inspecting. Okay. Yeah, and that, that could be um, the only thing. So you know, back in the 90s when OSHA shifted um, responsibility for their um, temporary labor camp standards from them to the wage and hour division, um, really didn't give us the opportunity to rewrite their regulations. We have lived with OSHA's regulations uh, the way anybody else has. Um, there is a formal procedure through the OSHA division of the Department of Labor to request a variance from a provision. Um, they're pretty methodical about it. Um, they're going to ask about, you know, different things about vectors and wind and drainage and proximity and number of head of cattle and things of that nature. Um, but there is, a, there is a, a procedure that they have in place to request a, a formal variance. Okay, because none of that applies to the range housing. The range housing has standards that are in, in the reg. And uh, yeah, and that actually, shows Kelly, include the 500 foot. Kelly's mentioning too, when we actually get back to the, um, <clears throat> the housing standards that apply in the standard 